Hello and welcome to Vikings Territory Breakdown Podcast. I'm Joe Oberly, uh, senior writer for vikingsterritory.com and purpleptsd.com. And I'm with my co-host, Mark Craig, who is the Vikings writer and NFL insider for the Star Tribune and the StarTribune.com. There, got the introductions out of the way. Mark, how's it going? Um, and he's counting down to training camp, ain't it? Oh, I can hardly wait, Joe. I mean, I, I'm so tired of golfing and everything like uh, playing, <laughs> playing golf this morning. And so, yeah, I want to be able to watch them play with their big bubble ha- hats and stuff uh, in those training camp cap practices. So this, this is a, a NFL writer, longtime NFL writer's favorite time of the year, isn't it? Well, I think even the NFL takes a breath at the end of J- July or uh, you know, beginning of July. So uh, even uh, even the guys who have to work out year round are probably taking a little bit of a break right now. Uh, so coaches, uh, I think the Vikings even started shutting the building down. I mean, like I don't believe it uh, for like a week or two weeks in July here. So everyone except for you know people on websites like this, and we're the only ones yammering on about it. Yeah, as you can tell, that's why I'm trying to fill fill a segment here. Mark, how's your golf game? Just kidding. Don't answer that. Um, anyway, uh, we wanted to take a little more of an in-depth dive on uh, head coach Kevin O'Connell this week as we're getting closer to camp and where he gets to start season two. Uh, Kevin O'Connell, first year as a head coach last year, pretty dang successful. He uh, comes here with not the, the greatest – resume for head coach i mean he's he was drafted by the new england patriots in two for the 2008 season uh he he lasted two games he played in two games through uh six passes completed four for 66 yards no it's for 23 yards i'm sorry and then he started moving Detroit Lions, New York Jets, Miami Dolphins, second stint with the Jets, and then the Chargers. Well, then he hung up coaching and – I'm sorry, playing and became a coach with the Browns in 2015, then with the 49ers. In, uh, he was on their offensive staff, and he was with Washington uh, where he met old Kirk Cousin on Jay Gruden's staff. Then he went to the Rams and picked up a – uh, Super Bowl ring as offensive coordinator there and then came to the Vikings. So that's kind of the long and short of him, Mark. What uh, uh, what would you say when you say that, look at that resume for uh, all of a sudden a head coach and, and uh, in this league? What do you think? Well, I mean, <clears throat> Sean McVay and a Super Bowl ring was what got him a head coaching job. I mean, he's um, – he had quite the, you know, quite the, the upbringing in the McVeigh tree. So, yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it didn't, I think I'm playing under Belichick and kind of, uh, um, you know, getting that uh, understanding of coaching. Uh, you know, he's, he's the modern, he's, I mean, like, as we said, whenever we were doing the transition from <clears throat> Zimmer to the new coach, he was everything that Zimmer wasn't. He was young, played in the league, played quarterback, likes Kirk Cousins, um, you know, can relate to Kirk, Kirk Cousins, um, completely different, you know, age wise and uh, style wise and coaching. So uh, it was, you know, pretty good year. You know, I, I, but I, that hang up for me is that is, is getting that third, you know, getting that home game and playoff game and then what happened to him in the playoffs. So uh, I think he did a pretty good job, but I, you know, I wouldn't, you know, I, I had him. Uh, on my because this year was the first year for the Associated Press voters, you had to you know tier your votes, you know one, two, three, and I had him as third. You know I had Kyle Shanahan as um, you know my pick for Coach of the Year. Uh, I thought what he did, Kyle Shanahan did with his quarterbacks was amazing, keeping a minute um, not only through one injury but two injuries. Uh, I didn't have Dable who ended up winning. I had I didn't have him in the top three. Uh, I forget who I had too, but I had O'Connell three and I, I, I pitched that to O'Connell and said, I got your number three in my book. And uh, he was like, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I think some people would say that, uh, you know, Dable doesn't call his own plays in, in, uh, with the giants. So Mm -hmm. I think what O'Connell might've done might've been, you know, the giants have been down for so long. Um, 
And, and I think Cole Connell is probably set up a little more to win right away. Uh, if as long as they didn't, you know, kill themselves with penalties and stuff like that. Right. Uh, but I still feel like you know, O'Connell did a probably, I would probably, I would have, I did rank him ahead of Dable when it came to that because I, you're not only a head coach, but he's also calling his own plays. So uh, I had this question on here for you. So I'll ask it now. Asking, so do you believe that, you know, talking about last year, did he get lucky in 2002 or was he better than we might have expected? Oh, I don't. I, I think in this league, you, you create your own luck. I mean, there were some. There were some times we we kind of joked about it last year with different things that happened with them. And uh, but you know, you're still in that position to whatever to whatever how bounced it was. You know, might have favored you. And there were some some things that that you know, off the top of my head, I can't really remember. But I don't remember us talking about like, wow, you know, right. this happened, this happened, this happened, and. Um, but no, I, I think he was a he was a good coach. He proved to be a good coach. Who the situation wasn't big wasn't too big for him. I don't think that there was a big um, learning curve for him. I think there there certainly was a learning curve, but not as big as maybe I thought there would be. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought he did a hell of a job with uh, Kirk Cousins. I thought he did a heck of a job, um, kind of using his gut instincts and the and the analytics of walking that fine line. Um, yeah, but t- toward the end of the season, you know, uh, probably not finishing as strong, and then certainly that you know losing that playoff game was kind of a, a sour taste to how you end your first season. You know, I guess uh, for me, he did a little bit better in the uh, play calling department because you know he he was offensive coordinator for the Rams, but I, I don't know that he he didn't call the plays. I think McVeigh was doing that, so you wondered him coming in. Um, how his experience would be in that regard. And I thought he did a good job. I mean, he made a lot of the, a lot of great decisions through the way, at least we could, we, we figure. And uh, so I was a little, I was uh, not totally surprised, but I was pleased by that because you worried that, you know, a first year head coach would be overwhelmed by it and that he would uh, you know, all of a sudden he's got to call the play as well. He, he took that, uh, you know, the reins on that offense, and uh, he had him doing some some very interesting things, and and uh, it was actually a fun offense to watch. I mean, they had, you know, you got Justin Jefferson, you got Kirk Cousins. Kirk had one of his better seasons as a pro, and certainly in winning games, you know. So some of that has to be attributed to uh, O'Connell, wouldn't you say? Oh yeah, I think for sure. And I think, you know, Kirk's, you know, statistically it was not one of his better years, but I think he played the position better. Um, maybe as better as best as he's ever played it. Um, you know, being under this guy and uh, certainly taking a little bit more, you know, a better risk reward type of deal where um, again, we've, we've said this before, but you know, the play of the year in the NFL doesn't happen if Kirk doesn't, doesn't let that ball go and give Jefferson a chance to go up in Buffalo and make that catch. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that he worked well with Cousins. Um, you know, it's pretty obvious that Zimmer and, and Cousins don't, didn't, didn't and don't like each other. Uh, def- old defensive guy, you know, uh, and a quarterback. And so now, you know, you got uh, O'Connell having played the position, not as well as Kirk, but having played that position, understand that position, understands it, you know, mentally, uh, and, and, and O'Connell will tell you that he just didn't have – basically didn't have the NFL arm to, to be, you know, a starting quarterback. But, you know, hey, the guy, the guy was a backup in the league for a while, so he, he understood, you know, how to play the game. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, he gets a lot of credit for how Kirk played, sure. How do you think their relationship is between uh, O'Connell and uh, Kirk? Uh, you know, Kirk's sitting on a, a, a contract year. Uh, he's he, and he's perfectly fine with it. He's been through it in the past. Um, a new regime comes in. They always want to get their guy. I mean, that's typically what happens, you know. And the Vikings did draft a quarterback, although not in the first round, like they probably would have liked to. Um, do you know these guys had a short stint together in Washington, so they they had some history together. Do you think uh, they have a decent relationship and that, uh, um, you know, they understand where each other is? I mean, they got to, you know, fit everybody under the salary cap. Kirk makes a lot of money. Um, 
Kirk would love some security, but he doesn't need it. You know, I mean, do you, do you, what do you think that relationship is like? And do you think it's it's something you can build on, or is it just like, is this a placeholder season for Kirk, and then they're gonna eventually, you know, as soon as possible, bring in their own guy? No, oh, I think what happens, the future will be written this season. The future, what we what that Kirk's um, Kirk's future beyond this season has not. You know, you can't say that it's been decided because it hasn't. I mean, it's they've put the ball, uh, the, the situation with their where they were financially, uh, where they were with Kirk's contract, where they are with actually with, you know, whether they want to go farther along down the road with Kirk is right there. It's all in front of all of them. And I think Kirk is has proven to be mature enough. He's been through this going back to high school. Uh, it kind of in a prove it, prove it, prove it mode. Uh, he's bet on himself before. He's always come through. He's always gotten that next contract. And he'll get that contract, whether it's here or somewhere else. If he's successful, I think the relationship where the relationship comes in, uh, where, where them having a good relationship will help, is that I believe that if he plays well enough here, the Vikings, and they want to go uh, another contract, uh, he'd be more willing you know, to, to do it here as opposed to um, cause if he plays well, if he plays well, he'll have options. I mean, if he plays yeah. well, he's still young enough that he would have San Francisco. He would, he has these connections to Shanahan. He has connections, uh, McVay, you know, McVay, you know, the Rams could be, you know, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, if, if they, if they miss the playoffs and Kirk's terrible, then it kind of, you know, the, the advantage goes to Kirk doesn't have the advantage. So. Uh, and the Vikings probably don't want him uh, going beyond this year. But I think it's set up to where, you know, Kirk, this is the first time since 2015 that Kirk has had a same play caller, mm-hmm. uh, uh, offensive coordinator, uh, back-to-back year. So, yeah, they're set up to go with the next step. And the, the next step is is for them to to win a playoff game and, and to be you know, make a playoff run. And so, yeah, if the, where the relationship helps them is that Kirk would be – I think we sign on, you know, would sign on and come back, and uh, you know that that's that's the that's what everybody kind of I would think would hope for. Even if you don't like Kirk Cousins, I mean, how can you, you know, if they were to do be successful and go another step? Yep. Um, I mean, he's he is one of the top, you know, ten quarterbacks in the league. That that's an interesting point. You know, a good season for both of them would make, would uh, make fertile ground for for resigning him and. And, and I would be for that. I mean, I, I obviously there's nobody ready to step into the wings yet. Now, if they if they have a terrible season, then 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 maybe the Vikings are headed down to the front end of the draft down there, and they can pick up a decent quarterback and start grooming them. But yeah, that's that, that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, you know, uh, it, that relationship is so important, and we saw how uh, when it isn't. Uh, going very well, like with Zimmer and Cousins, it it uh, things can head south in a qu- in a in, in a minute, and and it kind of did for for both Spielman and and Zimmer because you know it, it, you know there was all kinds of reports that they never uh, Kirk and Mike Zimmer never met that often, and they tried to force a relationship there in the late years, but it was too too late by that time. And and Zimmer was just never happy spending all that money, wanted to rebuild his defense, and so unfortunately, the defense went to hell, and the relationship on offense went to hell. So that was uh, that's why the Vic- That's probably why those guys went down the road. You know, certainly can. Well, and I, I think you know, I, I still say Zimmer. One of his biggest mistakes was when Gary Kubiak decided he'd had enough of COVID and, and coaching in that, that type type of conditions and, uh, and, and retired again, you know, to just slide, um, uh, Clint Kubiak over and Gary Kubiak retired and slide Clint Kubiak in and just think that you're keeping everything the same because it's a Kubiak was a huge mistake. Um, you know, I think cousins, uh, worked well with, with Gary and, you know, they had, you know, the, they were a pretty good offense at that you know, point. It wasn't like they were a terrible offense. And um, at that point, when it, you know, it's not having that uh, offensive coordinator. If you're going to be an old school defensive guy, your offensive coordinator's got to be, you know, top notch. He's got to be exactly what you're looking for. And it's got to work out. he got a good relationship. Just like if you're a young offensive guru, your defensive coordinator's got to work. And that's where we saw one of uh, – Kevin's biggest, you know, 
missteps was picking a defensive coordinator. And that's, that's no small uh, misstep for, you know, as he found out that they were kind of, uh, right. They weren't on the same page from very early on in the season. Gary, uh, um, Kevin didn't get him on, uh, didn't, didn't get, didn't change him enough to, to, to be happy with it and fired him. I mean, that decision was made, I'm, I'm guessing, very, very soon, sooner than whenever it was announced. So yeah. it just never worked out. So that's what you need whenever you're on one side of the ball. You need the other side of the ball taken care of. Yeah, it'd be nice for the Vikings to to sync that up for once. I mean, with Zimmer through his years, he had he had guys good on offense, but soon if they were good, boom, they were gone the next year. And uh, then he had the guy from uh, uh, the Eagles that didn't work out on offense, and he had the the one you just talked to. I can't even think of his name. He didn't want to. Uh, well, we had a couple couple that didn't work, so it'd be nice to get you know got the offense going maybe. Maybe now with a Brian Flores, this hire will help him. Of course, he'll do well and be gone anyway, too. So anyway, with that, we'll take a quick break, and we'll come back and talk some more. Uh, and Kevin O'Connell will take a deeper dive into the head coach, and uh, we'll be back with more on the Vikings Territory Breakdown. Okay, welcome back to Vikings Territory Breakdown podcast with Mark Craig from the Star Tribune. We're talking about Kevin O'Connell, head coach of the Minnesota Vikings, who's about to start his uh, second season, his sophomore season it, and, uh, as the head coach. Um, you know, he did. He was 13-4 and four in his first year. He's uh, – uh, and I'm going to ask that question later. Uh, but uh, he did have a good season. But I, I, let, let's, let's look at him and who he is and what makes him up. Mark, what do you think are his strengths and weaknesses as a coach so far that you've seen? You only had one year to – to make that uh, determination, but uh, I'm sure some things uh, have come to the fore. What what would you say are, are uh, KOC's strengths? I would say strengths include, um, you know, getting the, you know, um, what it takes to um, relate to the modern player. I mean, it's kumbaya, the, baby. Kumbaya. It's the kumbaya. The stuff that I, I you know, kind of uh, laugh about and make fun of, but, it is a different, it's a different world. You, you know, the, the parcel style, um, you know, I was reading, reading a book on uh, the big blue uh, machine or something like that. Uh, Parcells. Mm -hmm. It's funny. It's a, there's a part in there where the left tackle is off, you know, he busts up his chin, the left tackle is getting his, his chin sewn up and Parcells comes down and goes, where the hell is such and such uh, drawing a blank on his name, but um, get in there, you know? And so he, the guy runs in and he's got a, He's got thread and a needle hanging off his chin um, <laughs> as he's playing the, you know, playing the game in the, in the 89, in the, the, the Super Bowl team in 90, uh, 90 or, or 86, one or the other. Um, just things like that. You know, uh, and that's Ronnie Lott, Ronnie Lott. Yeah. Uh, so there's a different way of coaching. There's a different way. And Wes, Wes Phillips was really good on explaining, uh, you know, just, you can't, you can't, can't give him the kick in the ass like you used to. Uh, so I guess that's a, that's maybe, um, that's a strength of his. Now, when we get to weaknesses, we could also say that there's, uh, in some ways, can he adjust when he needs to adjust and be firm when he has to, whatever you're trying, not say he's trying to be their friend, but you're coaching in a certain way. There's always going to be a moment where you're going to get a player or something where you got to like, Hey, I am still the boss, you know, right? Hey, right. can he do that? You know, I, I you know, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, he had a good 13 wins. Uh, another strength I would say is um, he's got a good instinct. He's got, he got a, you know, he does have a, to hear it, to sit and talk to him. I mean, they all have to know what they're talking about, but to see, to hear him, like, uh, I know that he's, he, he, he has, like, he uses about 10 or 12, 10, 10 or 50 times more words than he needs to when he's in a press conference. I think, mm -hmm. I think it might be that by design because the, the number of questions get shrunk very, very, uh, down quite a bit because if he's going on and on and on and on, well, that's what but, you and I do. We got yeah. So, so so uh, so to me that he you know, to hear him uh, talk about what he saw, or what he so he has a pretty good he has a really good mind for offensive football, and I feel like he has a good instinct but uh, balance between gut instinct and uh, and analytics. Hmm. Um, now, now weaknesses. Yeah. I mean, there are some weaknesses at thirteen wins, but if you look at now, this team did get beat forty to three at home by the Cowboys. 
this kind team right. did get blocked team, that one out, Mark. I so this team uh, also, you know, twenty four to seven against the Eagles, second week of the year. You know, I, I'm almost like, you know, hey, that's that's going to happen. That's a, it's an outstanding team. You're on the road, you're prime time, uh, but you come home and you're roll, you're 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 a pretty good team, and you get beat forty to three by the Cowboys at home. Last six games of the year, including the playoffs, you're three and three. You're zero and two in your division. You, you know that that really bad loss against the uh, at Lambeau, the bad loss against Detroit, uh, and then you lose at home against the Giants. Uh, and also, and if you this would maybe play into what I was saying about how can you get firm with the players when you need to. Mm-hmm. A big part of that loss in Lambeau Field was was the just the you know wearing the shoes, wearing the. Uh, you know, they didn't want to, they didn't, they went against what the team was telling them, what the coach was telling them, what the, yeah. what uh, uh, Dennis Ryan was telling them, um, Hey, you know, you got to wear this, this, this cleat. And that may seem like a small thing, but you know, they, by the time they got their footing in green Bay, you know, they, they, they were, they were a beaten team. I so, thought that was a terrible move for whatever, whoever you're throwing, hanging that on. That was that, that to me, that that's all they lost that game that, you know, so you know things like that. Um, so I don't know. He he's, he was. I think he had a had a pretty good first year, um, but you want to see him. You know, you he's not, he's not a finished product. Let's put it that way. You mentioned earlier. I mean, last segment you talk about uh, at Donatel, and he made that hire, and he knew that it wasn't working out, and he tried to get him. I think to change up things a little bit, I don't know, but maybe that comes into what you're saying. Maybe he doesn't have the ability as well to just walk into the defensive room and say, Ed, cover somebody, you know, and uh, you know, we got to change things up here. We can't, you know, blah, 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 blah. And and it didn't really happen. We didn't see a marked difference in the way Ed was doing the defense the whole season. And you think at some point you got to change that. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, if we're trying to boil it down into a nutshell, it's can you make the transition tradition transition from being the, you know, which I think is a pretty good new wave, new, modern coach, uh, motivating in that way to, you know, I'm the boss, you know, this is, we got to get this, you know, you know, being firm, being, being like there's times to be, you know, their best friend and, and motivate them that way. And there's also times to kick them in the pants and, and say, you know, uh, and do some of the, you know, Things that used to be done in football. Uh, on a different on a different thread, uh, you you said to me, um, you believe he has some decent inst- instincts for the position of head coach. What what makes you say that? What have you seen that that might say that he's he's got some decent instincts? Well, I think at one point because I, I remember writing a story about how the, you know that he, he the, on this exact topic, and they were um, they were ten and two now. As soon as I said he he was uh, I, I think I caught him uh, like uh, uh, he, he wasn't he was because uh, they, they had the whole situational masters and all that stuff I kind of yeah going with that and said he was a you know situational pretty darn goodster because it was like you know he's, he may not be a master but this guy's making a lot of decisions that are good instincts and uh, at that point he was seven for twelve on fourth down uh, the Jets game uh, stood out to me where it's a tie to tie game. They're at their own 49 yard line. You know, they had kind of a sluggish start and he, and it was fourth and it wasn't like fourth and inches. It was like fourth and two, a long two. And he went for it, which I thought, you know, at the time I'm like, yeah, that, I mean, he did that things like that. I thought throughout mm-hmm. the season. So it's fourth and two, you're at your, you're at your own 49 yard line. You're in a tie, tie game, tie game at home with a team that you should beat. You know, that that kind of sort of cries out for you know conserve being a little conservative because you're going to beat this team over the course of four quarters. It's it's in the first quarter. He goes for it, uh, and they use not only did he go for it, which I thought was impressive, but he also uses Justin Jefferson as a as a decoy, and they end up throwing the ball to KJ Osborne for a first down. That that mm-hmm. I, you know you know was like wow you know that's I like that and. Uh, you got a lot, but you also have to tell yourself if that had not worked. And they also went on, went down and what scored a touchdown, went up 10 to three. I should have, should have had yeah. that part. Uh, but if it doesn't work, then you, you know, you should like kind of use what you thought when it happened. Uh, and then there was a, another time where I thought he went against all of the Minnesota Vikings history when it comes to kickers and everything. 
at the end of, <laughs> at the end of the Washington game, they kicked a field goal and they went up by three, sort of late in the game, uh, you know, maybe a minute left, minute and a half, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And Washington had a penalty, so he took the point and. and uh, and Greg Joseph wasn't kicking well at the time. I and mean, Greg Joseph was struggling with some extra points and stuff like that. And O'Connell took the points off the board and then ground the clock. He said, now it's a tie game again. Grinds it down to where there's just like a second left. They kick the, then they kicked the, the extra point. So they, they took the ball, you know, rather than, you know, trust their defense, which they couldn't do really. You know, he takes points off the board. I thought, wow, you know. Because yep. at the time I was thinking, uh, oh, I don't know if I could do that because, you know, uh, I could just see Joseph, you know, missing that that kick. Uh, right, first year head long, coach was not a long was not a long kick, but still, it's a lot of pressure when you take points off and have to put them back on. Yeah. Uh, so those were two instances. Um, also, at the end of the Lions game, the with the one they won at, at home, uh, it's a three point game, I believe. There's like. 40 seconds, a minute left. And he, you know, <clears throat> rather than kind of play conservative, maybe go for the tie, whatever. I mean, that's when he used, again, he used KJ Osborne. Um, that's when Kirk completed two long passes to KJ, including a long touchdown pass. Mm-hmm. And really kind of, that was a, a, a time where he's like, you know what? He stepped on the gas and, and scored a touchdown and they win that game. So that's a good example. A uh, good example of how he went against his analytics was, you know, all the analytics say, you know, you win the coin toss, you defer, and they were doing that. And um, But then when he got a good feel about his offense, there was a game or two games where – or I know there was one game where I asked him, I said, you know, why did you go against, you know, the analytics? And, and uh, you know, let's say you don't – you know, you win the coin toss, you defer. And he just went on and on about how he had a feel for his offense. And then he said, you know, you can set the tone with your offense as much as you can with your defense. And then he kind of smiled and said, the, basically, the analytics people hate when I do that, but sometimes I got to do that, you know, which I thought was really good. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you say he, he proved to be a bit of a risk taker uh, uh, in last season. And uh, I, I think that's a little bit different than his predecessor was on offense. I don't know that Zimmer took a lot of risks. I mean, on his defense, he would. When he make a call on defense and do some blitzing, I think he was a little more aggressive. But uh, uh, can can you point to some of that, or maybe that's what you were just doing? There are some times when uh, Kevin O'Connell was was taking some risks, and and uh, well, you know, I think O'Connell last year ended up nine of nineteen on fourth down. Um, so is that good. That's pretty good, right? Well, it's, it's, it's under 50%. I mean, at That's one point true. he was, he was seven for, he was seven for 11 and um, the best, um, the team's best since 2012 was um, uh, the 2012 team was seven for, for 12. Uh, mm-hmm. So, uh, but like Zimmer uh, last two years of Zimmer's regime, it, he, he went for it on, you know, 22 times in 2021, 23 times in 2020. Some of that is because you're not as good a team. You're probably going for fourth down at the end of games. You're getting beat, stuff like that. When Zimmer, in 2017, that, that you know, wild year with uh, Case Keenum, they only went for on fourth down seven times. They were one of seven on fourth down, um, <laughs> and they won 13 games. Um, so, you know, I, I think – but I also feel, you know, Zimmer – it wasn't like Zimmer was this – you know, throwback to the 1950s. I mean, I th- Zimmer did, you know, occasionally take risks. Uh, I think that I think that O'Connell um, takes took more gambles, uh, but I also feel like the entire league does that now. It's so yeah. much more aggressive. The league is aggressive now, and I feel like if you don't, and it's not just the young guys. Andy Reid, if you have a good team, you know, you take a lot of risks. I mean, Andy Reid. I mean, it helps having Patrick Mahomes and all that uh, firepower. But Andy Reid's a guy that's, you know, is almost Zimmer's age. Yeah. Uh, or, yeah, I think he's a couple of years younger than Zimmer. Uh, but, um, you know, he, he's every bit as aggressive as these younger guys. And I, li- I, I like where the league is going when it comes to these, these guys. And, so do and I. Aggressive they are. It's, it's good to have a coach that's willing to do that. I mean, you know, nine times out of ten, when they are going for it on fourth or, or you know, when, when the – down and distance uh, warrants it. I'm saying 
uh, go, you know, I'm, I'm sitting at my house and saying, go for it, go for it, you know, cause that's what you want. You want that offense to keep going. I have to do better at being able to willing to accept when they don't. Make yeah. It. Yeah. It's... But I, I, you know, I, if I'm honest with myself, I'm saying go for it because, you know, especially with the defense we had, I mean, you, you mentioned the jets game. I was at that game and, and I think twice down there that the, the uh, they took the lead, had to go down there and get the lead away from the Jets, and the defense coughed it up. So, you know, you got you to gotta keep the – you can lead the way with, with offense. Um, you mentioned analytics. Uh, that, that's, that's an important uh, part of coaching today. Uh, would you say, right off the top of your head, would you say what's the percentage of teams that use analytics? Is it pretty much everybody now, or, or is there still some holdouts that just don't – you know, I know you don't know everybody's front office or how. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we obviously when they hired Quasey, we did a bunch of stories on that. Um, you know, I, I, you know Quasey came from two that are probably the leaders in the league, you know, San Francisco, Cleveland, um, and, and now Minnesota are probably the, are the top three, I, I would think. And, I, you know, there's, there's, there's got to be some holdouts. I forget, I'm trying to remember what there was one or two that um, I can't, I can't remember right now, but. Uh, you know, certainly the Vikings are, are leaders, you know, go from Quasi on down, obviously. Uh, and for Cleveland, Andrew Barry on down. San Francisco has been doing this for years. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, in some way, shape or form, teams have always had analytics. It may not have been called that, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, I still I struggle with it because I don't I think in football, there's not there's so many variables or the the the, the uh, sample size is smaller. Um, to me, it's whenever, okay, uh, fourth and one, I, I always joked. I said, if I have Lamar, if I had Lamar Jackson, fourth and one would be, I'd go for fourth and one on the, on my own three yard lines you know, or whatever, you know, <laughs> or, or my own 13 yard line, because whenever he was rolling, he's going to get, or, or Josh Allen, or, you know, it's, yeah. how do you, how do you compare like when you have that, as opposed to me, you don't have that. Well, Josh and Allen just, couldn't get one yard from the end zone last season in, in a certain game. So, but, you know, that's, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I, think, I mean, things like, it's like, so I understand where they're coming from. And, and that's where I feel like, you know, a, a plus for me for O'Connell is he's not, you could just tell by how he calls a game and also how he explains himself. He's not a guy that's just going to, he's going to do what the book tells him to do. He's going to use the book. I mean, and they're, and and also when it, what helps with him is by being the play caller, by being the head coach, head coach, play caller, offensive play caller, the rhythm of, of what you want to do and how you can do it. And I think that helps. Yeah. You know, sometimes it gets choppy if you have to call a timeout and then there's confusion and head right. coach is telling the offensive coordinator what to do. Offensive coordinators in his first year of doing this and, you know, all this going on, the defense has time to react, you know, set up all this stuff. I think whenever he makes his, I think he's good at making his decisions. However, it gets streamlined through the, he's got a, his situational master. uh, That's a, that's kind of monitoring all of this, this part of the game. Um, You know, it, it, you know, gets, feeds him the information and he makes, you know, I think he's pretty good at making quick decisions. And then obviously being the, the play caller, he knows what he wants to go with. So, it, it, you know, they got guys up in the booth that are looking at it, you know, saying, okay, they got the analytics over here. They're sending them down. This is what the analytics say to do. And then he's got to factor in his gut, and then he's got to make the final call. It all comes down to him. So he doesn't have to do what the analytics say, but he's open to it. Is that what you're kind of saying? So he, he – Yeah, uh, for sure. In. Um, you know, ultimately that's, uh, you know, I think you got to factor it in. But it can't be the it can't be all of it because you know you know you're if you're right you're right nobody cares that's what you should have done if you're wrong then you're gonna get lambasted by fans in the media you know and uh, um, the paycheck's pretty good but that's still not the best the best uh, way to live so I, I guess that's that that's the way it is I guess there's not really a question here but I mean I, I think I'm I'm very happy that the Vikings have a team that's open to it that's good at it maybe they've got some guys that you know can think think fast because you don't have a whole hell of a lot of time to make these decisions and and get these things down to a coach and and he's got to make a play it's 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 not it's not an easy thing I, I would think well yeah for me for the analytics um you know 
probably where where it, it would be it's got to be proven it's got has to start with the draft because that that with what whatever goes into all of Quasi's decisions and everything um to me is uh, and, and uh, uh, Dalvin Cook um is is you know that that's an analytics situation that um, I think any even your your dumbest analytics team could figure out hey running backs 28 years old you know we all know about running backs and you're playing the odds and stuff like that but um you know I don't know what goes into the analytics for his his draft picks but I think uh over time we won't know until over until there's been time you know like I like the, like Andrew Booth is a good example what what convinces you that Andrew Booth to take him where they where they took him with his injury history and um, and if he, if he does, if his injuries don't ever go away and he's a bust or he's a, he's a guy that just can't stay healthy. It's like, like to know, you know, cause my analytics, you know, what did it tell you? What, what did they tell you about this guy that may, that maybe, you know, the rest of us were saying it, keep your hands off of a guy who's got an injury history. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's so much that goes. You make a great point about how many variables to have to. And I, I, you know, just in the, the small, totally tangential experience as coaching grade school basketball that uh, I couldn't, I didn't want to call timeouts because I didn't have anything else to say. And you're coaching on the fly and, and I can't imagine it in the NFL. You have some time and you can take a timeout and think about things when you need to, but God, it's such a game of momentum. And if, if your offense is rolling and you got the bat, the defense on their heels and don't give them a chance to, to recover, you can either force them to take a timeout. I mean, you, you, don't, you don't want to screw up and give that defense a chance to to collect themselves and make the right decision. So it's 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 tough. I think, I think he has a little bracelet that says WWJD. What would Joe do? Yeah, that's got it. And then they probably watch films of your your basketball games and and think. You know. Okay. All right. I, I, that'll teach me not to bring myself and my coaching career but, uh, into this discussion. The the game management coordinator or the master situational master and all that stuff that Ryan Cordell is, uh, and we did. Um, you know, I think everyone when they called it that, it, that was part of the uh, like when they came in, they they were not shy about telling you how much they knew and how much they you know thought they were going to be, you know better than others, I guess. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, in a lot of ways, they, you know, it did come, it, you know, hats off. I mean, they, I feel like they're, they're, they're situational masters. Their, their game management coordinator did a pretty good job and, and it was a pretty good setup. And uh, especially for a first year, uh, their touting of the, uh, their, their, uh, their training staff and all of that, uh, that was a pretty healthy team. I think he took care of them and, um, I think it was a healthy team. So some of the things that they said, they, they, they came through on. Uh, I also feel like, you know, it just it all comes back to how did it end? You know, it's like, you know, Hey, real good start to the year, but man, I just can't, I can't rubber stamp it as a great year because people get pe- players get uh, injured players, older players start to be less effective maybe as the season goes on. And, and maybe that's why their numbers, when you talked about, you know, how well they did on fourth down earlier, maybe that starts changing at the I don't know and maybe other coaches reacting to how Kevin O'Connell coached and they start maybe getting some tape on him and maybe the second time around certainly certainly the uh, Giants saw him the second time around were ready for him so I I don't know maybe that that may have I mean the the Vikings got Daniel Jones paid I mean yeah we'll see how Daniel Jones does but uh, he should be sending some of that money to Ed Donatel they made him look like Steve Young uh, in that playoff game well, you know, just like coaching grade school basketball and, and the frenetic pace that that has, I mean, keeping you filled with uh, good questions uh, to keep this thing rolling is just as tough a job here. I probably should have called the timeout before I asked and talked about my, yeah. my coaching experience. So I'm going to do it now. We're going to take another break. Timeout. And we'll be right back. All right, folks, welcome back to Vikings Territory Breakdown. Uh, as much as I'd love to talk about, you know, more about my high school or a grade school girls a basketball coaching experience, when in fact we did win a tournament, and my plan was to keep them in there despite the fact their tongues were hanging down to here because they didn't have anything to tell them, but we won't talk about that. I won't talk about that and fill a segment with that. I, uh, 
I guess I'll, I'll just uh, hit you with this one, uh, Mark. What would you, you know, the guy was 13 and four. He won a division for the Vikings, which, uh, you know, Zimmer had in the previous year. Um, and they got a playoff game. They didn't do well in the playoff game, but they still had a great season, especially as a, in a rookie campaign. And they, they, they ran it back. They didn't, you know, they did their competitive rebuild, you know, some aging guys with new faces. So what kind of grade would you give uh, KOC on his first year as an NFL head coach, I guess? Uh, <clears throat> first year as an NFL coach. I, I would say uh, blah, 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 blah. A, a B minus. A B minus? Well, only because, you know, they, they were, um, I, you know, he was kind of, I mean, the, the, um, the being staying competitive, you know, the, the, the Wolf saying we're going to, we're going to still going to be super competitive, the yep. competitive rebuild. Uh, uh, they, you know, he was, he was set up uh, personnel wise yes. know, to, to be successful. Okay. Uh, so I feel like, you know, you know, the personnel was there for him. Uh, wasn't like you, like you go to Chicago and they tore everything apart for you. So, you know, I feel like he should have had, you know, a decent season. Now he took it to a different, to another level. Um, when the, when the number one seed was, was there for him, you know, and we talked about earlier in the year, I don't know what, I forget where it fell, but the, you know, getting just destroyed at home by the Cowboys was, yep. you, know, you know, that you got to ding him for that. Uh, and then when you're, you're going down the stretch and that number one seed is in reach yeah. and you know how important it is because Philadelphia <laughs> you know, beat your butt in week two. And, you know, you can't, you, you don't, you can't go back to Philadelphia and then to lose to the lions, um, at, you know, on the road to, to lose to the Packers, your, your, your two division teams there that you played down the stretch. Um, and they did beat the, the bears in the last game, but, um, you know, then that Packers, you know, that, that pack, they needed that Packers game because that was, you know, they're still in the, in the hunt for that number one seed and all this stuff. Um, you know, that, that hurts that that's, I got to, you know, ding him for that. And, and then the playoff game, you know, it just, right. I know, I know he thinks your defensive coordinator, uh, it, you know, needed a new defensive coordinator. I know all that stuff, yeah, but defense. to me it was, um, yeah, yeah it's, you know, your offense wasn't good enough either that day. So, uh, yeah, so I'd say yeah, I could robust B minus, which I would have taken and ran to the clubhouse with when I was in school. Right. Well, you know, you, you mentioned uh, – look, well, we both mentioned the competitive rebuild. Should they have done that? Uh, should they not – shouldn't they have re- – I mean, they're kind of rebuilding right now. Um, they're, they got rid of most – you know, some big-name uh, uh, aging veterans. Eric Kendricks, Patrick Peterson, uh, Dalvin Cook, Adam Thielen on both offense and defense and had to get rid of those contracts for those older guys – um, who are still all, you know, are going to contribute for somebody this year. Um, you know, you're a new coach, head coach coming in, your new regime. You want to do it your way because that's ultimately what you're going to be judged on, not on what you can do as Zimmer's players totally. Uh, should they have rebuilt last year and 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 taken their knocks and so that they're quicker forward? Are, 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 are the Vikings a year behind now because they did the competitive rebuild and uh, – or do they just have a better idea of what they have? I don't know. What What, what are your thoughts on that? Because... Oh, no, I mean, no, I I mean, cause they were in a different situation than the Bears. The Bears were closer to the bottom, and the Bears had their had their starting quarterback that they want to build around. Uh, so it's a d- different situation. Uh, you know, the Bears were closer to to needing the uh, explode, you know, to have it blown apart. I mean, if you if you did that, if you tore the Vikings apart last year, you don't have. I mean, last year was a lot of fun. Oh last yeah. Year, Last year was a 11 one win, 11 and 0 in one, you know, in the regular season, 11 and 0 in one score games. I mean, that, I mean, the Buffalo game, the uh, Colts game, I mean, they set a record for the biggest comeback in NFL history, uh, had the best game in the league uh, at Buffalo, and they won, upset, you know, it was an upset. Um, you, know, you win a division, you win 13 games. Uh, to me, you know, I wouldn't trade that. I mean, yeah, it didn't end right, but. I would. I, you always. You're always, to me. You're always trying to win. If if you got a team that you feel like can can go, and they had a home game, they they should have gone farther. 
So yeah, the, the, what they did was spot on. I mean, are oh, you not going to get me to argue? I've been watching them since '61, and I, I, uh, this top five season for me. I, I, I had as much fun watching them this past season because of the emotion, the drama, and the way they won, and the craziness, and and the epicness, and the record fashion that they did. That yeah, no, I, 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 I had a blast. So I, I, I'm not saying as a fan standpoint. I'm talking about from from the coach's standpoint, because when you come in as a new regime, you've you got to build that up and do your own thing. And, you know, if, if, if uh, they did blow it up, then, then, then they're in line to maybe draft one of those quarterbacks this year that they, they probably need, they know they're going to need in the future. And now going forward, what's, what's it going to be for O'Connell is his honeymoon period over because he went 13 and four last year. And now he might be a victim of his own success where the, the fans are going to say, okay, you were 13 and four last year. If you're not that way this year, when in fact you're rebuilding, we're going to get on your ass big time. I mean, you know, is, is, uh, does that say anything to you? Is there anything you think about that? Well, uh, it's funny. Cause I remember, you know, we talk, sit around talking to Bud Grant, and many times, you know, I could be like, "What advice would you have for this new coach or that new coach?" Bud would always joke, you know, "Don't be too good too fast." You know, well, see, uh, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think and Bud was like, uh, I think Bud was one in five coming out of the shoot or something like that. Or, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, but to me, I mean, if, what do you? I mean, you, you don't give that up. I mean. It's not like this year. I mean, they, they should, they, uh, people should expect them to win the division. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, that, I mean, Detroit's the popular pick and, uh, you know, the bears could be a surprise team. The Packers, who knows, maybe Jordan loves got it. Uh, Packers still have pretty good defense and, um, you know, but to me, you should expect them to win. I mean, they, they have, they have a good, they have a, they have a quarterback that they can win with, you know, uh, offensive line is a strength. Uh, should be a strength. Uh, tackles certainly are. Uh, you got the receivers you need. You got your running backs are still good enough. They made a commitment to to getting first downs and short yardage situations, so he should stay on the field longer. Uh, defensive coordinator should be better. So it's not like you know, well, well, we didn't get it last year, so now they're they're going to be like a two win team. You know, I think that they still are a threat in the NFC uh, where they're at. So I think you know they're. Uh, I don't, you know, they didn't throw, you know, Kirk Cousins away. It, it, they just kind of put themselves into a position like, you know, we know we want to go this far with him. Do we want to go farther? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that'll be determined. And, and I, I would expect that, you know, Kirk will have, will sign some sort of extension next year because I feel like him being in this system the second year in a row and being with uh, O'Connell and, uh, that's still a good enough team. I think that he will come out on top with this, I guess if you want to call it a gamble. The gamble, you mean? Uh, well, 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 he's betting on himself and all that stuff. And we've talked about that a couple of weeks ago. I was like, you're betting on yourself, but you're, you're yeah, look how much house money you've. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like if you win a bazillion dollars at Mystic Lake and you decide to let half of it roll or whatever. Well, fans are going to expect him to uh... – to take another step, you know, they're going to expect them to have that, to, to win the division, have a home playoff game and, and then, and then win that game. Um, I'm not sure that that's in the cards for what's going on with, you know, that, you know, they're rebuilding the defense. What do you think? Well, I think secretly all Vikings fans expect something to go wrong at the end because it typically does. Right. I mean, that's, you talk to any, any Vikings fan that with the scar tissue that they have, uh, you know, and rightfully so. I mean, uh, the, their best teams, you know, have either fallen short Super Bowl or are in more, the modern day, the modern fans. Um, boy, they just can't get over the hump in the, in the NFC Championship games or, or in the playoffs. Uh, this was a different a different type of uh, – it wasn't a kicker that screwed up uh, in the playoffs. But yeah. the people should expect them, yes, to, to you know, get a home playoff game, win a playoff game, be in the hunt. But, that, you know, it's – a lot has to go right, you know. I mean, there's, there's also, you know, Philadelphia is 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 a still even though they had a lot of people, uh, a lot of players leave and stuff. Philadelphia still, is, you know, so it has a heck of a team. And so San Francisco could he be better? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's it's not going to be easy. But I think that, yeah, that they they're one of the teams to beat. 
a lot of a lot of has to go right <clears throat> and you could uh you know i was just thinking something when you said earlier when you talked about the best play of the year kirk had to throw that pass out there i mean you can hold that up as there we go that on one side of the coin as the best play of the year and then you can go to the other side and look at Kirk Cousins not exactly making the play to throw that pass short of the sticks and end the playoff game at home against a team they should have beat. So uh, you got your yin and yang there. Things all have to line up. I'm not blaming laying that all on Kirk's feet. You know, there's a lot of different things that happen in that play. And But to see him throw that pass. <laughs> Has to Justin Jefferson in the Buffalo game and just say, oh, I got to go for it. And then in that game, he just didn't go for it. You know, he, uh, he threw it to uh, short of the sticks. Oh my goodness. What a, what a bummer way. Well, to end. But that, that's exactly, you're, you, you hit the nail, nail on the head. Uh, is that in that game, Kirk is you're 31. Absolutely. hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's well, another one of my cliches. I don't know if you ever heard that statement, that, that comment of, uh, Kirk goes 31 of 39 for 273 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions, like a 112.9 passer rating in that game. So everybody who loves Kirk, that's those are your numbers. That's 31 completions out of 39 in a playoff game. Pretty dang that's good. It. But as you said, there's where where Kirk is. You, there's enough fuel for both sides of this div divided argument. Is you know, you just laid it out. I mean, um, the way that that kind of there were time when, when um, games or or series, you know, drives end with these like you, know, you come, they come off the field. And you're like, you know, that's all you got. I mean, it was like they can have the quickest, most disappointing, deflating three and outs or or ending to drives or games that you'll ever see, but then he can also play extremely well. That's being a Vikings fan and uh, wonder it would be nice if Kevin O'Connell could somehow rise above all that and make this team into one that, you know, you, the one that I used to watch in the seventies when you, 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 the, the vision was a given. And I'm sorry to say that because, you know, I was, I was a kid back then and, and, and uh, but every year he expected the Vikings to either be in the hunt for it or to win the division because that's just what they did. You know, Packers were no good. Uh, the Lions were the Lions, and and you know it was just it was just there for the taking. Well, um, I don't know that you can do that in today's NFL. There's too too many ways that uh, teams can go up and down so quickly. So it's but it would be nice to know that you know you're not uh, uh, lining up on. In, on your couch on Sunday and, and hoping, you know, okay, are we going to win this one? When a little bit of, yeah, we should win this and we're going to win this one and we're not going to go do it. But, you know, well, you know, and the way the Packers found the, the modern way the Packers found a way to, to stay on top was <laughs> they just happened to draft two Hall of Fame quarterbacks back to back. And, I, and I'm reading the, the Vince Lombardi book now. Um, it's uh, one of the best sports book, the best sports book I've read. Wow. Um, but uh, even he, even Vince Lombardi back in, in 1959, 60, talking about the pro game was like uh, the one thing he didn't like uh, about the pro game was that, that it's a he, it's the ultimate team game, but the quarterback has too much importance in the in that team game. You know, like so, yeah. you know, we look back and say like someone like Bart Starr as being like a million years ago, and but you know that was his guy that you know stood above the others, was able to call his own plays on the field and and be the you know, field general and still could throw the ball a little bit. Uh, but, you know, that you, you take that and multiply it by, you know, a million for today's game. And it's all about, it's not all about the quarterback, but, you know, it's so much more about the quarterback than anything else, which is why, you know, you, which is why they, you know, you, when you had Kirk, he might not be the best in the league, but you, you roll with him and they're still rolling with him. And uh, it's time for him to step up and whether they're going to continue to, to roll with him. Kevin O'Connell knows that, you know, he's itching at some point to get some quarterback that he can start grooming for, for the future. And, uh, um, you know, I hope he doesn't take Bud's advice to heart. I want him to win next year. Expect well, it, you know, two for crying out loud. I mean, part of this uh, doesn't work if you, if Kirk has a different personality, um, you know, Kirk could, could definitely get very miffed about it and, 
and you know, all you got to do is look over in Green Bay. And they obviously, those guys, uh, when they got upset with their teams, you know, I mean, a little more uh, pelts on the wall, Favre and Rodgers and, and Kirk. But Kirk could have pitched a fit um, and probably might have pitched a fit if, if he has a different head coach. So that relationship going forward, uh, whether Kirk stays here you know, or how they, how they perform this year with that looming over top of his head, uh, free agency looming um, is no small feat for a, for a quarterback and a co- coach to, na- to navigate. Yeah. Well, it should be an interesting season going forward, both for Kevin O'Connell and for everybody else as usual. And it's coming up soon in a couple of weeks. Uh, training camp's going to start maybe a few weeks here yet. The training camp will start and we'll have much more to talk about. We're going to have more to talk about in the meantime. Uh, um, you know, it's it, it, a, a, uh, as usual, it's just another fascinating uh, season to 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 look at because there's so much, and we'll find we'll learn more about Kevin O'Connell as he goes into this training camp and and moves forward. He's got a bunch of younger players, more uh, you know, to to navigate. He's got uh, um, he's got he's got his offense pretty much intact, which seems the way he wants to. So uh, I don't know. I, I I expect it won't be you know, uh, six and 11 season. I think they're going to be, you know, right there uh, at 500 and battling to go above and, and, and for that division. And, and a lot of it comes down to KOC, right? Oh yeah. I mean, a huge part of it um, comes down to him and, um, and how he, you know, how aggressive he is. Well, uh, and, you know, and, and I, th- I fully expect him to, to get better. I thought it was a good year. I think he'll get better. That's nice. That's, that's a good point to end on. Uh, we did it. We spent the whole uh, show talking about the head coach. So that's pretty good. You know, that's, that's, you know, we're even better than we thought. Mark. So, yeah. So we've said he's good. Uh, so when he gets fired at, at when they're at the 10th week of the season, we'll, we'll say, well, we saw it coming. You know, <laughs> this guy was no good. And we, we knew it back in July. Oh God. Yep. You can see it. Coming. Brian Flores with the next head coach. No, yeah. I'm kidding. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Mike Walden behind the scenes. Thanks to everybody for, for tuning in and checking us out. We'll be back again next week. And thanks to Joe Johnson, who is going to somehow upstairs, he's going to guide this team to a Super Bowl championship at some point. I hope it's uh, before I join him someday. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, Joe, hats off to you and to everybody else out there. We'll see you next time. Skull. Skull.